Hello and welcome to this video on commercial load calculations. This video is going to be an introduction which is going to summarize all the rules that you will need to complete your load calculation. And then in the next upcoming videos, we will see actual examples of commercial load calculations with me filling those out. Also with a summary and a layout of how to fill out that specific load calculation before I actually get into that example. So look out for that video, but this one's gonna be rather simple. We're gonna want our codebook open. We're gonna be looking at the codebook. You're also gonna want a highlighter or something to underline stuff with so that you can go back in your codebook later and find all the stuff at ease. So this first one we know from the past, this is 220.14J where it says dwelling units. Okay, so this obviously doesn't apply to this, but this is where we see the three volt amps per square foot. But this tells us that we're not gonna be using this three volt amp per square foot unless we're dealing with dwelling units. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of this because this is irrelevant for this video, but it's good to know that we're not gonna use the three volt amps per square foot. But instead for our lighting load is going to be found in article 220.12, where we see lighting load for non-dwelling occupancies. We also see a table that accommodates this. Okay, before I go any further, I want to mention that this video is inspired from the channel Electrical 101 and his video, NEC Commercial Load Calculations. He shows an eight step process to completing the load calculations. And I thought it was a great idea. And sometimes why recreate something that is already a really good idea? That's my outlook on life a lot. So I want to share his idea with you, the eight steps of doing this, but I also wanna let you know that I got this idea from his YouTube channel. So go be sure to check out the original video, go give his original video a thumbs up and all that. Okay, but now going back to article 220.12, we have the table, but when we have a table, we should always just read the article that goes along with it. Most of the time, it's not all that much. And I'm talking about at least just reading the first, where you see a general under 220.12, the very first thing. And this is because sometimes you're going to find some information that you won't find on your table alone. And you might also get some directions on how to use the table. Okay, so first off, we see that it says that we're going to use table 220.12 for non-dwelling occupancies. Also, we're going to have the floor area determined by article 220.11. If you didn't see my residential load calculation video, it's basically saying we're taking the area of the house and we're turning that into square feet. And furthermore, this is calculated from the outside dimensions of the building. Okay, then it also says something rather important here, that if you have motors that are going to be less than an eighth horsepower, and if they're connected to the lighting circuit, then they're going to be considered a general lighting load, which means they're going to be added to that part of the load calculation. Okay, so now we know that we can look at table 220.12 now, and we see this shows us our general lighting loads if we're using a non-dwelling occupancy. We see a vertical column on the left with all the different occupancies we might have, and then we go over to the right where we have volt ampers per square foot. This is what we're gonna be using, and we see the rating that we're gonna be using. For example, we see the automotive facility, is at 1.5 volt amperes per square foot. And also restaurant is the same, 1.5 volt amps per square foot. And we see workshop is 1.7 volt amps per square foot. So this is the table you're going to be using for that. And that's going to be step one here of the load calculation for commercial. We see under the table, there's a 125% multiplier for continuous load. Okay, so we need to keep that in mind that when we're dealing with a continuous load here with commercial occupancies, that we're going to need to have that additional 125% for that portion. The thing is using this table already has that math into this. So the continuous load is already included in table 220.12 when you're using this full amper per square foot. Okay, we're gonna get in the next step, step two. Remember we have eight steps. Some of you are probably used to a 12 step program, but here we only have eight. Okay, next is step two. We have table 220.42. And we have demand factors for hotels, motels, warehouses, and then we don't have demand factors for all others. All others are at 100%, and we see that in table 220.42 in the same table where we have our demand factors for our dwelling units. And then we have step three, which we're already used to doing enough, and that comes from article 220.60 which is just gonna tell us to pick the bigger of the heat or the AC, and we're going to omit or not use the smaller one. So if we have heat that is bigger and the AC smaller, we're gonna use the number for heat, 
and we're not going to use the number for AC. Next, we have step four. We're going to want to go back to article 220.14. Okay, we're going to want to look at the subsection E where it says heavy duty lamp holders. Here it tells us we have a 600 volt amp minimum for the outlet load for each heavy duty lamp holder. So each outlet for the heavy duty lamp holder is rated at 600 volt amps. That's the minimum. So of course, if they tell you it's more than that, then you're gonna use that. Okay, next we see the subsection I. I tells us other outlets. So we see in the beginning, it tells us except for the subsection J and K. And this makes sense because J is dwelling units. And then K is a little more specific, is for office buildings. So other than that, all other outlets are rated at 180 volt amps each. And of course, these are all minimums. So that's your minimum of each outlet for all other outlets. We're going to move on from there to subsection G. We see show windows. And to sum it up, it tells us that we're going to have 200 volt amps per linear foot. Then we're going to go to subsection H where we see multi-outlet assemblies. There's more to it than this, but just as a placeholder in your mind, we see that each five foot at 180 volt amps. But if we go into subsection H, we see there's the also subsection one and two. Subsection one tells us that each five feet is going to be rated not less than 180 volt amps, but this is where appliances are unlikely to be used simultaneously. Then we see subsection two tells us where appliances are used to be simultaneously. And we have that same number, not less than 180 volt amps, but this time instead, it is for each one foot. Okay, now before we get into the office buildings, just one more thing to add on I receptacle outlets is that it does say 100 volt amps for each single or for each multiple receptacle on one yoke. So of course, we're used to a lot of times seeing the duplex receptacle to where we see two different outlets on one yoke. That's an average plug you'll see in your house. We can probably all look at one and see one of these currently right now. And it's telling us that for this circumstance, it's gonna be 180 volt amps for each yoke. But if we read further in the article, it tells us that if we have a multiple receptacle that is comprised of four or more receptacles, that each one of those receptacles is going to be rated not less than 90 volt amps per receptacle. Okay, so I'm just gonna draw this out. We're used to seeing that plug in our house to where we see the two different outlets, one on the top, one on the bottom. And of course, there's the yoke on that. So it's basically saying per the one yoke, since it's all connected, that's the whole point of the yoke, it's connecting and bonding all the metal together. Per one yoke, we're gonna count this whole thing is one at 180 volt amps, okay? But then of course it's telling us if we have four or more, and it calls the multiple receptacle. So it's one of those ones where there's a bunch of different outlets you can plug into. Still you're gonna have one yoke. And then even if you have one yoke, doesn't matter. Each one of these separate, when there's four or more, is going to be rated at 90 volt amps each. Okay, and because of that, we see one, two, three, four, so of course, if we do 90 times four, we have 360, and that'd be volt amps. But if we keep that in mind, we see that's double the amount of two. So it makes sense because a lot of times you're not gonna have three, you're gonna have two, and you're gonna have four. Sometimes you have where there's just one. I don't really know if I've ever seen one with three outlets though. That might occur, but I've never seen that before. So I think it's because it's a lot more common to see two, and you have 180 volt amps, and it's also common to see four and you have 360 volt amps. Those are the same rating per the amount of outlets that you have. So that makes perfect sense. And then to add to that, if you have more than four and you just kind of start to go crazy with it, well, you're going to still have to add the 90 volt amps per each. So it's still going to keep going up from there. So it logically makes sense. And that's good that something here in the code book logically makes sense. And I saved the best for last 220.14k. It's really simple actually once you break it down. This is where we see office buildings. And it tells us that we're just going to be using our calculated load from section I. Of course, this is after all the demand factors have been applied, which is pretty straightforward. But what we got to understand from subsection I is that's telling us the amount of outlets we're using. So that's where we go back to section K here. And we see subsection two tells us to use one volt amp per square foot, okay? And there's no directions on how many outlets we're gonna be using like we had in section I. Because of this, you can think about it, 
like subsection one is when you know the amount of outlets you have. Subsection two is when you do not know the amount of outlets you have. So if we don't know how many receptacles are gonna be in a building, we're gonna have that additional one full amp per square foot. And furthermore than that, if we don't know how many receptacle outlets we have in a building, that one full amp per square foot is going to be added on the demand factor from table 220.12. So we see article 220.12, we see office buildings, and it has a 1.3 volt amp demand factor. So when you know how many outlets you're using, you have a 1.3 volt amp demand factor. When you don't know how many outlets you have, in the building, you're gonna have that additional one volt amp per square foot, which is going to turn this demand factor into 2.3 volt amps per square foot. Okay, next we have step five. We're gonna to wanna to look at table 220.44. Here's a table that we haven't used before, so let's look at the article that goes with it, and that is article 220.44. We see it as receptacle loads for other than dwelling units. And we see it's telling us that the receptacle loads that are calculated in accordance with 220.14H, which is where we saw that fixed multi outlet assembly section and then also section i which was the 180 volt amps for each of the yokes unless there's four or more all that those receptacle loads shall be permitted to have the demand factors in table 220.42 or table 220.44 we're going to be using table 220.44 because we look at it it's demand factors for the non-dwelling receptacle loads it's pretty simple we have the first 10 kilovolt amp portion at 100 percent the remaining portion anything over 10 kilovolt amps is at 50 percent this also means that if it's anything under 10 kilovolt amps there's no demand factors because it's just rated at 100 percent but of course this table will remind you and assure you of that. Moving on to step six, we're gonna wanna look at table 220.56, but this is another table we haven't used before, so let's first look at the article. Okay, and to sum it up, it tells us we're gonna be using table 220.56 for kitchen equipment, but we want to read the last sentence, and it tells us that these demand factors shall not be applied to space heating, ventilation, or air conditioning equipment. That's may be kind of obvious but that's the only kind of important thing in here it's good just to read it and see if there's anything important now we're going to look at table 220.56 we're dealing with other than dwelling units okay it's a funny terminology they're not going to say commercial they're going to say other than dwelling units or non-dwelling units so in other words commercial and here are the demand factors for the kitchen equipment on the left we see the number of units of equipment so it's just telling us how many separate equipments do we have of kitchen equipment we see if we have one and two it's at a hundred percent kind of funny they didn't just put one through two but they have one and two at 100 percent so anything over two we have a demand factor we see three is at 90 percent four is at 80 five is at 70 and then six and over is at 65 percent so you're always going to be using 65 percent if it's over six and there's no additional addition that you're going to have to do no matter how many additional amounts of kitchen equipment that you have okay now we're moving on to step seven and you can see we're almost done here but actually step seven is basically the last step other than step eight which is just telling us that we're adding everything together how to add it together which has some very important information in it but just know step eight is basically adding everything together and step seven is something we've already done in the past and that is described in article 220.50 but basically to sum it up and make it simpler we're going to take the largest motor and we're going to multiply it by 25 percent we're going to add that number one time to our load calculation then we have step eight which is the service we're going to divide the volt amps by the line voltage. Now this can be rather simple if let's say you have a 240 volt single phase system. In this case, you're going to take your total volt amps and you're just going to divide by 240. There's nothing new there. But what happens if you have a 208 or maybe 480? We'll say 208 volt three phase. What are you going to do there? It's three phase. Okay, then are we just going to divide by 208? No, we're not because we have three phase. We need to keep in mind that when we're using three phase systems, we have this multiplier of the square root of three. This is something you're gonna see a lot when you're using three phase motors or when you have three phase transformers, like you're gonna have in a 
three-phase system here. You're going to really want to know this square root of three number. If you take your calculator out and you plug in the square root of three, you might get a number. Mine just tells me the square root of three again. So I actually have to end up pressing this button right here that has an arrow next to another arrow. It says F to D, so I think it just says fraction to decimal. When I press that, you see it turns it into a decimal point. Just FYI, if maybe you have a similar calculator. We see we have the number 1.732. We'll cut it off there. A lot of times I'll just call it 1.73. We're just call it 1.732. Okay, so the square root of 3 we're going to think about as 1.732. Because, of course, we're going to want to multiply by something, and we're not going to want to multiply by the square root of 3. We're going to want to have that solved out already. Okay, so we have our 1.732, and what we're going to do is use this as a multiplier to multiply the voltage that we have. And then that total number is going to be the number we divide by, since we're using a three-phase system. Okay, so to sum that up, if, it's, if we have a 208-volt three-phase system... It's going to tell us to get 208 volts, and then we're going to multiply that by the 1.732. We're going to get a specific number of 360.256, okay? And you want to keep everything very accurate when you're doing these load calculations. And you're going to not want to round up any decimal points unless you're working with your very last number, your amps. So once you divide everything and you get your amps, you can round that up. Other than that, you don't want to round up any of your numbers. So at the end of your load calculation, when you have your total volt amps, you're going to divide by 360.256 exactly. You're going to use that exact number, okay? Okay, now let's say we have a 480 volt three-phase system. All it's going to tell us is to get 480 volts and to use our multiplier of 1.732 in place of the square root of 3. 480 times 1.732 gives us 831.36. And again, we're going to use that exact number, and that's the number we're going to divide our total volt amps by. After we divide our volt amps by that number that comes from the voltage, we're going to have our amps, and with our amps, we're going to go to table 310.16 to find out our conductor size. When we go to table 310.16, we're going to want to go under the column 76 degrees Celsius, and we're going to want to find the amp that accommodates with the number that we have. Of course, we're going to round up to the next number. If we're in the middle of two of the numbers that we see here, then we're going to go to the left and see the size of wire that goes along with the amp that we just got from this table. After we figure out this wire size, we're going to use this number of our wire size when we look at table 250.66. This is then going to tell us the wire size for our grounding electrode conductor. And we need to keep in mind that this is never going to be smaller than the neutral. So we see the rating at the very bottom goes over 1100. So if we have any wire size over 1100 kcmil, then we're just going to use 3 aught copper no matter what. This, of course, is the wire size we're going to be using when we're bonding to the building, UFER, and to the water pipe. Okay, so that's it for this video. Pretty simple and straightforward. It's good to have something like this that removes all of the numbers and just gives you the basic facts, especially when we're looking at the codebook and reading it all straight from there. If you found this video helpful, give the video a thumbs up, leave a comment, tell me you liked it, and to see more videos like this, subscribe for more. And until next time, thank you and goodbye.